So my last video I uploaded was expository and I just kind of rambled on things from off the top of my head. This time I decided I'd prepare myself with some notes and probably the most of the second half of this video will be actually read from my notes. I ended up deciding it was easier just to write a script out. So I'm going to tell you the historical side of my journey, and then I will talk more about the deeper spiritual realities that compelled me towards Eastern Orthodox Christianity as a former uh, evangelical Protestant myself and a Bible college graduate. Um, I think the, for, the best place to start is I was going to an evangelical church, and I liked this church. I was not unhappy in that I was to the point of looking for something else. It was, it was one of the churches I had liked more. I loved the pastor. I loved the sermons. I loved the music. I knew a fair amount of people there. I can't say I was close to, to as many people as I would have liked to be. Um, probably a lot of my own fault, but I, I didn't go looking is my main point. Um, I had a lot of friends at my Bible college who I trusted, and several of them were looking into this thing called Eastern Orthodoxy. Now, I had been raised being told about the evils of Catholicism, and which I, I don't view it as evil anymore, even though I have my concerns with it. Um, but I had never heard of the Eastern Orthodox Church, except maybe a handful of vague references, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. Um, some of my video games had mentioned them. And so I decided on principle that I needed to at least know something about it. And of course, the fact that these were God-seeking friends uh, that I had witnessed, you know, wanted truth. I knew that I at least should give it a chance, should look into it. And I, I felt that way about a lot of different things. Um, I think in my head, I considered myself open to any religion um, if it was true, but I was sure that Christianity was the way to go. Um, I reached a point where uh, I went to an event at one of their houses and they were having this discussion in the garage and I asked them, what do you guys believe about the Bible and is the authority for Christians? Like, how do you know what's true? And one of them explained to me that he said, you know how you believe the, that Jesus uh, got the apostles together and made them the authority and then they wrote the Bible and the Bible became the authority. I said, yeah. And he said, well, we believe that they never stopped being the authority. That as scripture says, the church is the pillar and ground of truth. Scripture is profitable for teaching, but the church is the pillar and ground of truth. And I said to myself, well, that's possible, but I doubt it. And so that, that floated around in the back of my head. Um, Eventually, it got to the point where, and this was about a year after I graduated from Bible college, that I decided I would go to a service with them. And I think I only caught the tail end of it. But the highlight to point out is that I absolutely hated it. I prayed, in fact, that it would end as it was happening. It was a liturgical service, formal. I thought it was boring. I thought the iconography, the paintings of saints and Bible stories around the church were ugly. I thought the vestments were ugly. They had incense burning, which weirded me out. In retrospect, it's all throughout scripture um, from the beginning of scripture all the way through till Revelation mentions incense as a, as a icon of prayer, as an image of prayer. Um, but I really did not like the service at all. And I did not have plans to come back. But at the end of the service, as I was leaving, the priest came up to me and introduced himself. And I remember it, it, was, it was as simple as him saying, hi, welcome to our parish. It's great to have you and you're welcome back anytime. But as I shook his hand and heard this, I... I all I can say is that there was something about him that was different. And it was the kind of thing that I think deep down in my soul, I was hungry for. I, the best way I could describe it is that this man was opaque, meaning he was clear. He was that, that you could 
say anything to him and it wouldn't faze him, that his, his stability truly came from somewhere else. You could insult him, you could degrade him. Not that I had any intention to, but that there was, in fact, the opposite, but there was something about him that was so invincible and I knew how sensitive I was. I knew how easy it was to, even as a nice person, for my buttons to be pushed. And so what ran through my mind was, I, I've got to know how to be like him. I've got to know where this came from. I found out he had classes you could take, but the problem was he required you to attend the services if you wanted to be attending his classes. So I was wondering if there was any way that he would let me attend the classes without coming to the services because I had hated them so much. Um, so I kept promising my friends I would look into this, more into this Orthodox thing. And a couple months later, they took me to lunch, two of them, and they said, hey, we're going down to a monastery in California. We know you're unemployed. We also won't charge you for gas because we had an extra seat in the car anyways, and the monastery will feed you. So since you've been promising this, that you would come look into this Orthodox stuff. This is a perfect opportunity. You have no excuse. And I decided they were right. I had no excuse. And so I made the mistake of going to this monastery for five days. Uh, St. Herman of Alaska Monastery. It's near Redding, California. So it's the Northern California area. I was there. We, we arrived to a four hour prayer vigil. Mind you, I probably caught 30 minutes of that service that I was so miserable and I prayed it would end. So now here I am in this four hour prayer vigil, mostly standing as the early church did. And the next five days were God mashing me up and showing how judgmental I was, all these double standards that were from my emotions. Uh, one example I would give is my, uh, I was looking around and I was watching them kiss pictures of their dead saints and some of them were bible characters but i was just like why would you kiss these pictures of dead people to be honest i said this because that's what i had heard other people say but at the time i didn't think of it that way but what popped into my mind was i have a picture of my dead cat named godzilla and i miss Godzilla a lot. 15 years of my life, he was there for me through depression. He's a beautiful cat. And I realized I kissed this picture because I miss him so much. And in my, in my conscience, I just felt it was so hypocritical that I would kiss this picture of my cat out of affection for what, who, I mean, he's a cat, but he's part of my family. And yet I would judge people for kissing pictures of Christian heroes who were part of God's family who'd suffered for him. And it just weighed on me that it was such a double standard. And I started to go, you know, maybe this is not something legalistic or creepy. Maybe it's not worshiping them. Maybe it's something that's good for us. We need family. And I, I thought about scripture saying, you know, the saints, the saints are alive in heaven. They're not dead people. Um, scripture says, I am God, the God of the living, not the dead, which people will love to quote to criticize icons, but they never quote what comes after it. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it's linked back to back that God being the God of the living and not the dead is to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And these were the very people that I was calling dead people. So I was actually criticizing something that was entirely Christian and biblical and was actually, in all honesty, a faithless thing to be criticizing. It wasn't because of truth I criticized. It was because of self-justification. Um, as I left this monastery, they gave me a book called Our Thoughts Determine Our Lives. It was the life and teachings of Elder Thaddeus, uh, who lived in Serbia. And as I read this book, I some things I was like, well, I don't know about this. I don't know about that. But overall, as I read it, I saw the connection to the heart of the priest I had met. I saw that in the way this man talked and in the way he lived his life, it made sense how living this way produced a person who was opaque, a person who all they cared about was love of other people. 
And that, that had really bothered me, and I'll get to that in a little bit, but it really bothered me that altruism, as much as I wanted to receive true sacrificial altruistic love, and as much as I wanted to and was commanded to give it, I didn't seem to be able to muster it. And here was a man who had actually seemed like that might be possible. So still being quite full of myself, as I seem to persist in being, I decided I was going to prove the Orthodox wrong. I was going to study church history and show that even though they might have some cool things, um, I'm sure they were oversimplifying. One of the things I said to myself was, well, my Bible college professors would have told me if this stuff these Orthodox claiming, if it was true. And so I started reading some of the early church fathers. I would read different little history books and blog posts online and watch videos and read some of the excerpts. And I would go to Roman Catholics. I would go to Protestants. I would go to atheists and non-Christians, including some of the Orthodox sources I was looking into, because I wanted to hear as unbiased of a take as I could. And within three months, I realized that the Orthodox had the best argument there was, that the only other people who had a, had a possible leg to stand on of being the historical Christian church were the Roman Catholics. But it seemed to me stronger when I tried to read the evidence objectively that the Eastern Orthodox churches, which are a collection of churches that Roman Catholicism used to be a part of, the Roman Catholics will say all the other churches broke off from them, of course. And we say, no, you're one church that broke off from our family of churches. And that family is, for the most part, still together today. The, Rome, the Russian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, the Antiochian Orthodox, the Orthodox Church of America, all these different Orthodox churches, they're actually one church. Uh, it's just a matter of leadership and some cultural things. But they, are, they work together to solve issues in the church. They, we commune at each other's churches, meaning take communion. So I, I just realized that this, these churches actually had a 2,000-year-old historical lineage back to the apostles, and that all the evidence I could find was they were the one force in all of human history that wasn't changing. There were, there were little prayers that developed, but their theology was the same. They would appeal to the first, second, third, fifth, ninth, 12th century, all these centuries, and you could find this unchanging faith. Whereas what I had been raised in was um, a, a very cool and very multi-denominational Bible college, but it also was their Achilles heel. It was, it, you know, it was cool that I got to see Lutherans and Calvinists and other Reformed groups and Pentecostals and other charismatic groups and Methodists and Anglicans. And even, you know, there was some, there was a professor who'd been through Catholic seminary and it was awesome. I, I'm thankful to God, even more now looking back, that I got to see all these different views of how to be Christian. But the problem was I, I saw myself, how fallible I was. I saw scripture saying, lean not out in your own understanding and the only way I could choose between any of these groups was to trust myself. And it seemed that that was, they were all reading the same Bible. They were interpreting scriptures that were God breathed and important and they were interpreting differently. So it, it irked me to, to say that all these people seeking Jesus, that either they didn't care enough or, or what was going on. And I didn't see that somehow I had something that would be better, that would be safer and, and more superior to address these issues. And so I, 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 I was deep down, I think I was disillusioned, but I, I kind of buried it because I was like, well, this is what God has allowed. And, and so I'm supposed to accept it. But once I started seeing in history that there was a solution to this, that people had done what Paul had told them to, he says, hold fast to the traditions we taught you, both written and oral. And I, I saw that people had done this. And then I looked back at the Protestant world I was coming from and they basically, I mean, they didn't outright say it, but they basically lived, there's no oral traditions. Paul says that usually what they'd say is something like, well, it was all eventually written down. But the problem is that's just a tautology. That's not proof. Like, can you give me proof? Can you give me a scripture that says that? Because scripture doesn't say that. It says the church is the pillar and ground of truth. It says, hold fast to the traditions we taught you both written and oral. It says scripture is profitable for teaching and doing every good work. But it seemed to me studying history it had been flipped 
scripture was now the pillar and ground of truth and the church was simply profitable for teaching and doing good works. And I, I was really, I was really irked by that. And especially as I started to, to study history. Um, from here, I'm gonna start reading some of my notes. Within a year through the, these experiences, I saw that the changes in my heart, which I had looked for in evangelicalism, psychology, and even Buddhism, they happened very clearly and observably from the teachings and practices of Eastern Orthodoxy, from the services to the fasts, to the saints, to prostrations, bowing and, and even going to the floor in the presence of Christ, to their prayers, and even inter their internal way of thinking about other people. It wasn't just a change that happened, as lots of things help us grow, but it was that they explained the why and the how in ways that no one else could. And the changes that my experiences in Orthodox services with their fasting and reading the saints and living life as they prescribed and had 2,000 years of history to back up, I saw it produce changes far deeper than anyone else could. Nothing could, nothing compared. I visited Catholic parishes. I followed some of the things that, that they described. A lot of it was similar psychologically and spiritually to what Protestants had taught me, but something entirely different was going on in the Orthodox Church. And so within probably another year after the monastery visit, the three months of studying history, I became convinced that from the changes in me, not just from history, history got me in the door, but I became convinced from the changes I was experiencing in myself that it had to be, it had to be this Eastern Orthodox church. Um, and so I guess from there, I'm going to go into what specifically that was, what kinds of things I had been wrestling with before and how orthodoxy directly addressed just my experience of life itself. Um, so we'll go back a bit to some of my earlier feelings before this. Um, so I'll start reading from here. One of the things that bothered me was that no one could give a good explanation for suffering, nor of God's allowance of my sins. Life was mostly painful with little joy, in my opinion, feeling lonely, feeling depressed, feeling just dark, watching myself hurt and other people hurt. And this was coming from someone who was considered incredibly positive, and I took a strengths finder personality test to show you what strengths you had, and I got positivity. I doubted it because I was like, I'm so sad inside. And, I, and the people around me are like, shit, you're the most positive person at our Bible college. And this just floored me. So it wasn't because I was you know, this negative or black pilled, as some say, is not, I was not that kind of person. But I seemed to always be unhappy inside, always feeling alone, always wishing I was dead, even though I knew it was wrong. And I asked God to forgive me. I tried to love others, but it seemed like when I did good, those rare times, it was always an ulterior motive like having them like me or making me feel good for doing a good deed. It never lasted, and I hurt many people, and many people hurt me. I wondered if I would get married and hurt my wife and be hurt by her, and then have kids and hurt them and be hurt by them, and then wondered what I would say if they asked me about suffering. What I was told was that we suffer because of our sins, but... God forgives people's sins and delivers them from their sins all the time. I was told that I suffered so that I could help other people. But then I had to ask, well, why are they suffering? And then it just created an infinite regress of circular logic. I knew God was just if he let me suffer. But what father wouldn't reach out to save their children from such horrible things? I went to worship chapels at my Bible college each week and thought that the wonderful feelings I got there were God and were the Holy Spirit. But then they'd fade 30 minutes later, and I'd wonder why he had forsaken me again. I wondered why he kept letting me sin, too. I kept praying and asking for his help, and I felt I was sincere, and I'd beat myself up with shame because I thought that was what I was supposed to do. 
why would God allow me to be in so much pain and to keep sinning when I asked for help so often? In orthodoxy, theology matters. It's not just a bunch of doctrines to satisfy our rational mind, nor things to make us feel better or to tell ourselves that a debt is paid and we get to go to heaven, to the happy place. The orthodox idea of salvation is different and all the answers I needed flow out of it. The biggest thing is that it is purely relational. The idea is that God is pure agape, self-sacrificial love. Not just that he has as part of him, but that's literally him. And when we rely on him, that is the only way to have this true sacrificial agape love that we as humans are designed to have and to give from him to each other and to all of creation. It is him working in us and through us. However, we have relied upon ourselves and seen ourselves as the source of any everything since Adam and Eve. And thus we are nothing like God and are cut off from him by our own choices and hardened hearts. Thus we are saved by entering into his cross, his suffering in a literal way. And that breaks our hard hearts back into malleable dirt. Uh, one of the metaphors I give, it's a, it's a little weird, but I, I think it helps illustrate the point is that Christ saw that we were going to be stabbed with swords. And if we weren't prepared properly, the swords would kill us. So he, not needing to be or set up to be stabbed with a sword, put himself in the sword's way. And he said, if you line up just like this, when it hits you, it will miss all your vital organs and you'll live. And then boom, he gets stabbed to show us and so the spiritual life is like entering into his perfect position, his way of living and being in relation to the Father, so that when this happens to us, we're transformed by it rather than killed. So he bears something very real, but it isn't necessarily judicial or legal. So anyways, this idea that our hearts need to be dirt, that they need to be malleable, they need to be soft. Um, from this place, it is our hearts are easily made back into a truly human heart, and God then dwells in our soft heart even more. It is like a battery that we have let grow corroded from lack of use, and the purifying of it is like breaking the corrosion off so it can flow with the agape love of God once again. The early Christians actually said that God forgives all of us, even Satan, but forgiveness bears no effect if we do not change. We don't truly receive forgiveness. And so if we do not change, we cannot be in relationship with God any more than a person can have true intimacy with someone who is still selfish and abusive, even if we've forgiven them. When we come home to God, the father runs out to meet us like the prodigals, like in the story of the prodigal son. As King David says in Psalm 51, or 50 for the Orthodox, quote, you do not desire sacrifice, a heart that is broken and humbled, God does not despise. This is actually the same theology of C.S. Lewis's last book, Till We Have Faces. It's his personal favorite book and also mine of his books. We are, his, the idea he presents is that we're not full humans until we are restored to this state of having soft hearts full of perfect love. We do not have the ability then to have real intimacy with God. And so we cannot face God till we have faces. The metaphor is that God has a full face. He's a full being able to engage in relationship. But we being selfish and not relying on him and relying on ourselves, we're not actually real humans. Sin is not human nature, but the opposite. It's the one unnatural thing that's ever been part of us. And so God is restoring us to what we were made to be. It's much more optimistic view of humans than a lot of uh, the Christianity I grew up in. It's also important to note here that this self-reliance, this looking towards myself as a judge of good and evil, which is why I condemn others, as a protector of my own identity, which is why I get defensive when I feel threatened or insulted, as the source of my own comfort, 
which is why I please myself and try and comfort myself constantly. And many other things, these are the reasons why God lets us sin. And even why he gave us the law. It was because all these things made humans see their need for God and thus call out to him for help. So I'm still responsible for my sin. But the thing is, is God allows it for the very specific purpose that when I see, if I'm willing to see, that what I have done reveals I am nothing without God. That's the very reason that he allows it. Again, all of it is about relationship, even him letting us sin. I later realized that the worship music I was so attached to was actually a form of self-soothing I had control over and thus actually kept me from God. It was actually a form of idolatry and an addiction. The silent, sober-minded liturgical worship, which I had hated so much and which has been the worship of God since he revealed it in the Old Testament, was actually the antidote because it required me to give up my control over self-soothing and allowed God to act if and when he desired. And that's key to all relationships, um, that, that the other person is in entire consensual control of if they approach you and love you back. And so this idea that I just play the music I want as soon as I demand it, it, it trains us wrong. It's antithetical to relationships. I also realized that God let us sin so we could see our need for him because it humbled us. We are certainly still responsible, as I said before, but our sins are allowed by God when they will be used for a deeper good. The Orthodox saint, Seraphim of Sarav, said that the Lord allows us to fall into such terrible vices because he is protecting us from the even greater vice, which is pride. It's important to understand that though pride in Western culture means narcissism, thinking we're so great, Pride in the early church meant that meant self-reliance that I was talking about. Thus, shaming myself, as I had done in the past, was actually stirring the very thing that pushed me towards sin, a reliance on judging myself. Paul says in scripture that even he doesn't judge himself. What we're doing when we shame ourselves and are disgusted, which is different than going, God, I've done something wrong. We're actually putting ourselves on God's throne and judging ourselves. We're still playing God and seeing ourselves as the source. What we need to move towards is letting God judge us. We have to confess. We have to say, God, I've done this thing that is wrong and against your will and against love and is damaging to me and to others. But from there, it's God's business what he does. I'll also add that fasting, as the early church did, was very key. The tradition I had been passed was, a f um, <clears throat> was that fasting was not eating at all. While that was a form of fasting historically, the main form was to avoid filling luxury foods like eggs, meat, and dairy, and also to eat only as much as we needed. I was told in Bible college in the cafeteria by many students to eat and eat and eat because I was skinny. I think I actually hurt my body because of it. But worse, I was more reliant on self-soothing by my own power, making my spiritual illness and distance from God worse. When I started trying to eat only as much as I needed, I actually found it was far more difficult than not eating at all. I also started to notice the distinct difference between the voice of genuine need that said, you must eat something, your stomach is being damaged, and the other impulse that said, wouldn't it be nice to eat just a little more? It feels so good. I saw that it was similar impulse to the one that said, how dare they talk to you like that? You'd better tell them what they've done wrong. And also the voice that said, you should look at inappropriate things on the internet. That would feel good. All these voices through experience, not just dogma and statements of, of Bible verses, but actual experience that lined up with those verses, I could see what it was I needed to war with in my Christian life. So now I could see in these many practices that a change happened in me when I followed them. It had nothing to do with earning something from God and everything to do with an ontological change that needed to happen in me, something real. 
It wasn't a problem in an external judicial system or some record of bad things that God kept, but that I was a terrible friend and abused God and the world. But in Elder Thaddeus and in the priest I met and in many other saints and Orthodox Christians I met, I saw a deeper experience and transformation than I had witnessed in any other realm of my seeking, be it Protestantism, Catholicism, Buddhism, Hinduism, atheism, psychology, and other places. I do believe God will shock us that he was working many places that we would have never guessed. But I also now believe that there is a visible church, visibly united in faith, body, and spirit, and that it is truly a pillar and ground of truth, as Paul says of the church, which one can look to to find the fullness of healing and deepness of love that God desires for all men. I don't have to have abstract theologies of suffering anymore, but can actually taste and see how it changes my heart firsthand when I thank God for its saving nature. I see that with this lifestyle, with a 2,000-year-old family that physically and in tradition traces back to Christ, it is possible to have this agape love, though I've got a long way to go myself. I see that having worship that is historically rooted rather than something made up within the last century heals me and changes me from the inside out. Of course, we can still have our responses to God, but those come after. We worship first how he is revealed so that we're changed, and then we can go make our songs with harps and tambourines or with electric guitars. Um, but we, we've kind of skipped the first step. And, and gone right to the, the second things. And as C.S. Lewis was said, if you put second things first, you get neither first and second things. We have to put first things first, and second things, God willing, will be thrown in. Oh, where was I? I see that even my sin, when repented of and warred with, humbles me and makes me more deeply connected by God by removing the belief that I can solve my own sins, that I can judge myself, that I can do these things myself when he's the only hope. I have a hope that I have had never before because it's not a hope I formulated or that I repeat to myself to feel better, but one that has been held fast to and contended for, as scripture says, and was passed to me down the line from Christ. I will add one more metaphor here, and that's that I think most of my life I was told to focus on the stream of my behavior flowing out of myself, noticing that there's poison and, and dangerous toxic bits. Those are my sins and my misbehavior and my selfishness. Um, and it's good to see those things. We absolutely should. But what really needs to happen is that in the wellspring of our hearts where the water flows, the dead carcass there needs to be removed. And that's where all the poison comes from. And the truth is only God can do that. And so it's important that we're honest about what the poison is in our hearts so that we and God can be co-workers to remove that carcass from our hearts. But that's really the one thing standing between us and God is that something in us trusts ourselves and ourselves alone. And so all that Christ has commanded, all that he wants from us, all that the cross is for, all that all the practices of orthodoxy are about is, is being soft and malleable so that God can go with us into our own hearts and remove the source of the toxins, the pride that is there, out of which everything else flows. And if that happens, we become different people. We don't even have to preach at people or share Bible verses, not that that's bad, but it's secondary. We carry something with us, the, the Holy Spirit in us, more and more as we purify our hearts through these practices, through uh, another one of them being um, to see ourselves as the chief of sinners and to see other people as having excuses. It makes us give up the knowledge of good and evil that we're so addicted to. Um, there's so many practices like that. I would say if you, if you want to know more about 
this kind of spirituality I've referenced here that I would honestly say saved my life, that removed the desire to die from me, that made me feel at peace, not instead of suffering, but in the midst of suffering, there is a peace I cannot explain. I can try, and I did try, but ultimately it's beyond words, but it's a peace that surpasses my understanding. If you want to understand these things, I would recommend getting the book, The Mountain of Silence. Um, it's not a book that's going to try and argue you into being an Orthodox Christian. Uh, it could have that effect, but it, it offers insights from the first thousand years of Christianity and even modern Orthodox saints and elders about the kind of inner work, the toolkit that makes our hearts soft. And it's all out of obedience to Christ. It's all from him and it's all to his credit. And ever, if ever we don't see it as that, it won't work. None of it will work. It's always built on seeking him. But I think that book is a great place to start. Um, and I would say, if you have any questions, if you want to know more, ask me to clarify, disagree with me, ask for other book recommendations, um, feel free at any time to message me. I am a life coach, uh, basically a psychologist. You can't call myself one because I'm not, I don't have a seven year degree, just a four year one. But uh, um, I, I, my job is to talk to people going through difficult things and things that other people have not had good answers for. Sometimes, a lot of times, I help people who other counselors and pastors have ended up hurting, even unintentionally. So feel free to, to message me. I talk to people pro bono if needed, and I would love to chat with you anytime. Um, God bless you on your journey to finding truth and to finding love and to knowing him ever more deeply. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit.